good morning and welcome to the stream. Uh, my name is Dr. Rachel Tapman. This is my YouTube channel, which is for anybody who cares about language technology and other people. And I think I've been forgetting my channel intro. <laughs> uh, hello, Ken. All right, fabulous. So I can close this. Do, 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 do. Thank you for uh, letting me know. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be uh, a long one. Let me just <laughs> give you a little sneak peek of how many tabs I have open right now. It is a lot, but I am very proud of myself for getting organized and getting things done early this morning. And if you are in the uh, links please um, tier on coffee, the links have already gone out. So you have these in your coffee feed, I guess, is <laughs> the way that you get them. Um, I've also got a cough drop in. I'm gonna try real hard not to smack or make like mouth sounds or anything in camera, but um, the likelihood that I'm gonna start losing my voice is kind of high. So I've rearranged things a little bit from how I usually do it. So we're gonna start with practical stuff that you should probably know if you're working in language technology. Uh, and then we've only got a couple political things, politics. Hello, Multi Solutions. Welcome to the stream. Uh, and then again, just like a couple things on the ethics side, uh, and then we're getting into the bulk of what we're going to talk about today, which is research. I've got a lot of research papers, um, a lot of stuff. It's been, it's NACL, I think today is the last day of NACL, um, the North American meeting of the Association for Computational Linguistics, um, which is a big publication venue. And I think that's actually in Seattle, um, which is where I used to live. So uh, if y'all are in Seattle, I guess, have fun. Hi, me, Mian, Mian. Uh, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, but uh, hello and welcome to the stream. Uh, also, if you know the IPA for your name, uh, feel free to always feel free to put that in uh, for pronunciation. Uh, and then I have a special section on Bloom, um, which is not doesn't have a card in Ecosia, um, but is the multilingual large language model released by Hugging Face this week. So I've got a special section on that. We're not going to cover that in the research. Uh, and then finally, as always, we end up with some just like fun things to take you in to the rest of your day or help you wrap up your day, depending on um, where you are in the world. So let's hop on in with the practical stuff. I'm going to have some coffee. <laughs> mm. Okay. So uh, starting off, this is something that some of you may have heard. Um, so <laughs> people say this a lot of different ways. So PyPy or PyP or PyPI um, has the, the Python package repository that we all know and love has instituted two-factor authentication uh, for people who are maintainers of critical packages, and they decided what, what counts as critical packages, um, which I think is a fantastic move, right? We all rely on this. We all use software that relies on this, uh, and this will really help protect everybody's security. Uh, and if you are one of the maintainers of one of those critical packages, uh, they will actually send you a free security key, like, um, I mean, this isn't the one they're sending you, but like a little, UB key thing that you plug in and then uh, touch to prove that you have a physical asset that someone who also should be you <laughs> has uh, for your second factor. So uh, yeah, if you are a um, if you are a maintainer of one of these packages, a thank you for your service. I know that's a lot of work. Luke, hello. Uh, and uh, yeah, get you your free security key for two factor authentication. Uh, so just like you know, more secure for everybody. So. That was number one. <laughs> number two. Um, so I've talked a couple times on the channel about Markov chains. For those of you who are not super familiar uh, with Markov chains, it's... I want to say they're from definitely the first half of the 20th century, but I can't give you an exact date. Um, I talked about it in the language generation before computers. Um, I want to say the 30s and 40s, but don't quote me on that. But anyway, it's a, it's a way of generating text, um, like a large language model, but much cheaper and faster <laughs> to train. Um, and this is a story about um, somebody, Etsy, who was, Etsy is an online mm, handmade vintage marketplace, uh, who 
built a chat bot using uh, some uh, text data from one of their coworkers who had left uh, and Oh, what they did was they, you know, built this chat bot and then they, you know, deployed it. Um, and the issue is that a lot of their systems ran basically by chat bots. You'd send like the chat command and that would trigger something. Um, and the, uh, the problem is that it did start running some commands and nothing particularly bad happened in this case, but I think it is a really good uh, sort of warning story for us all to uh, consider that you should be very careful about deploying chatbots, uh, particularly if they might have code in them in situations where that code could potentially be executed. And if that code is executed, you might have some issues. So um, a nice little, uh, you know, warning, cautionary tale from uh, Andres Conberry, Conbert perhaps, uh, who's in Seattle. Be warned. Uh, and another very practical thing. Oh yeah, Luke says the only time I've used Markov chains is for generative music composition module at university and still don't fully understand them. Yeah, so, um, I guess a quick <laughs> uh, introduction to Markov chains using only my hand. I guess I could open a tab, but I don't want to mess up my tabs. <laughs> there are so many of them and they took so long to get organized. Um, imagine a directed, potentially cyclic graph, right? So if I, you know, um, wanted to create a finite state machine that would give me the spelling of the word apple, right? Um, I'd have like uh, a state for A and we don't go back to A, so it would then go to P uh, and then we do go back to P, so you'd have like an ability to go back to P or onto the next letter L uh, or onto the next letter E. So it would give you a possibly one PLE or a PPPPPPPPPLE or a PPLE if the only training data it has was the word Apple um, is sort of the general <laughs> intuition if that makes sense. Um, there, there's more to it than that, but that is my two second intro. Um, yeah, and they are, you know, they're trained on corpus data and they capture these, you know underlying patterns of use in the corpus data at the token level um, and you can use them to generate text. Second practical thing uh, is, uh, so this was a uh, news story, I'll click into it, maybe, <laughs> uh, from Global Happenings, not a, um, not a resource I'm familiar with, but uh, it had a, you know, bad headline, we'll talk about this study, an AI publishes a scientific article about itself. Um, so this is the one where somebody trained a, um, or generated something that looked like a scientific article using GPT-3 and made it the first author and um, probably should not have done that, but they did do it. Uh, and the uh, uh, thing that I think here is useful for us is that um, Daniel, you know, <laughs> reacted to this and uh, was clear about the limitations of the system. Uh, and he is quoted in the article saying, uh, Daniel Lofer, Lofer perhaps, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, from Mozilla, Mozilla, I know I said that wrong, Mozilla, who describes this test as an absolute joke. It would actually have been interesting to see the eight essays that the system actually produced, but editing them in this way only adds hype and misinforms people who won't read the details. Um, and this is in reaction to the editorial that was written by GPT-3, or more accurately, the text that was produced and then copied and pasted together. Um, so it's nice to see how, you know, when we talk about things as practitioners and the, you know, weaknesses of systems, uh, sometimes it can help prevent people from being misled, hopefully. So a nice example of a practitioner pushing back against type. Two, two. Uh, and then this one, and I'll post this link in the chat as well, is uh, a fundraiser for deep learning in Daba. Uh, in Daba, I don't know where the, the stresses go in that. This is one of those things that I've mostly heard, not heard, seen written and not really heard read much. And this is an organization that has done a lot of really good work 
um, in helping you know practitioners who are working in machine learning and AI and NLP in Africa. Um, and Mascane, which is the, I keep talking about them because I think they're doing really fabulous work, I believe originally came out of, of um, this sort of um, program. So they're looking for uh, donations. And if you're able, uh, would be a great place to give a donation to. Uh, and specifically, this is to help people um, travel to the conference to sort of, you know, meet with each other and learn and connect. So if you're able, a good thing to support. <laughs> uh, and more uh, very good very good advice. Uh, so Josh, Josh Mayer uh, is at Koki right now, which is an open source um, company that's doing uh, ASR and um, I think they're also doing text-to-speech. Mostly I've used their ASR, I haven't really used their text-to-speech. Um, and his <laughs> very solid advice that I would echo uh, is uh, don't create new file formats. Um, they're almost never warranted. Um, Yes, just don't do it, <laughs> uh, if at all possible. So an excellent uh, piece of advice to take to heart. Uh, and this is a little bit more in depth. So this is by uh, Kobus Grayling, who I'll, uh, I'll show the link to this as well, because I think that's a really interesting um, article. Kobus writes a lot, particularly in um, the, the chatbot space. Um, And uh, in this article, he sort of goes through using, uh, here it's the Cohere large language model as part of an entity extraction pipeline. Um, and the thing that I think is uh, really uh, a good, you know, I'm just gonna scroll. I sent you the link, y'all can read it if you want. But the thing that I think here is a good, uh, you know, example of a system is that, you know, there's a lot sort of going on here. Um, and the real benefit of using the large language model in this instance is that if you have limited training data um, that's very particular to your use case, you can use the large language model, which like just like word embeddings, right? You have the benefit of having something that's been trained on a larger corpus that you can fine tune with much less data than you would have originally needed. Um, and it's not right. It's not foolproof. Uh, so particularly if you um, needed a particularly accurate system, I might suggest potentially hand built rules uh, as your your first pass. Particularly for things like. Uh, names of movies, which you could definitely, you know, look up from a movie database, uh, but it probably wouldn't capture, unless you're using a corpus level, a uh, character level model, it probably wouldn't capture things like misspellings or typos. So um, that's where I think an additional, you know, language model based model on top of it can be helpful for giving your users additional flexibility. Um, but it got about 90% correct, which is, you know, not bad. Uh, I think it's just a really, you know, fair, thorough investigation of this particular approach. So uh, I recommend that giving that a read. Uh, I think in general, uh, Cobus tends to be very, you know, focused on practical stuff uh, and uh, does pretty good system evaluation. So, all right. Uh, and then we have a very rare thing on this channel, which is a um, use of computer vision I approve of. <laughs> So y'all have probably heard I, uh, me in some point in the past kind of bragging on computer vision. I think there are fairly few tasks where it's a good choice. Uh, I think this is an example of a place where it is a good choice. So the thing is uh, that they were doing is that they had a bunch of uh, profile pictures for speakers at this conference, and they wanted to create circular cutouts that had the, the people's faces in the middle. Uh, and the use of computer vision to do this, I think, makes a lot of sense. A, it saved somebody time. B, it was a pretty uh, specific use case, right? This isn't being used to like identify every student in every school system in Illinois, for example. It's being used in this specific instance. Um, also, the speakers provided their photos, so they knew these were photos that were provided with the intention of being made publicly available. Um, so I don't think it would be a surprise that they had been looked at by a computer, right? They're going to go on a website and no, uh, no, you know, gross violation of privacy expectations there, which is great. Um, 
and it's using facial detection, not facial recognition. So, um, and this is something I've said in the past, like recognizing, oh, there's a person, I think is generally fine. Um, recognizing, oh, that's John Smith from 1234 Main Street, not so fine, much bigger issue, much higher potential for harm. So a rare computer vision application that I think is all around a good idea. Uh, MB Timothy says, do you know of code on GitHub I can use to create an African dictionary? Mm. African language data sets. Oh, okay, so you're looking for data sets of African languages. Great question. Um, I'd probably uh, check Mascane, I think. I mean, there's, we've got a couple things in the research section that I don't know where they are right now uh, that talks about um, using a little bit of data from different African languages for multilingual news translation, I think, but that's specifically a news corpus. Um, yeah, I, not off the top of my head. Uh, I would poke around and I would look for like specific, um, specific languages if possible, right? So I'd look for like, you know, specifically, uh, Swahili, right? Or specifically Twi, or specifically, you know, uh, Egyptian Arabic, or like the specific language that you're looking for. I think you're going to have much better luck than sort of like searching for like all African languages. Uh, yeah. Good luck. It sounds like uh, you're working on a challenging problem. I also might check out Mascane. I think they have some data sets. Let me, you know, I can check that real quick. Mascane. <laughs> Do, do, do ongoing projects. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. Uh, so let me pop this in here. Uh, so this is um a research group that's specifically focused on NLP for African languages that's run by uh Africans. Uh, the I've, I've talked about this a bit on the channel, but uh, I believe that if you are working on a language, ideally, it is your language. <laughs> um, yes, so the thing I was thinking about was... Doo -doo -doo. Um, I feel like they did at some point have a... Uh, languages... Thing. Mm -hmm. Names. Mm -hmm. Did they release a data set? Okay, yeah, so they have a parallel text corpus, uh, but it looks like it's not released yet. And that'll be for Luganda, Swahili. I'm going to say that incorrectly, but. Uh, Ruyankora Rukiga, again, apologies if I'm saying that incorrectly, Acholi or Acholi, again, apologies, uh, and Lumasaba, again, I'm sorry, <laughs> very much if I, if I mispronounce things, it's not my intention, um, and they're going to do them in common voice. Okay, so you may check common voice as the platform, um, yeah, and I'll, I'll pop this in the, in the chat for you as well, so. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, but that's sort of the, the research group that I'm most familiar with that's working with African languages. Um, and I just realized that that text is very, very small. So uh, check out the link and, and read it. Um, also, in the sort of practical domain, if you are not subscribed to Ruha Benjamin's newsletter, I would definitely recommend it. Um, she's a really cool researcher uh, and, you know, just thinker who I really admire. I found, I subscribed to her newsletter and I found it to be really um, uplifting and interesting. And um, she, she talks about bloom scrolling as opposed to doom scrolling. So helping to cultivate, I don't know, a positive vision of the future and how we're going to get there. So uh, I would really recommend uh, her newsletter. Um, and then Viral Justice, How We Grow the World We Want is, I believe, coming out soon. I'm not, I don't think it's quite out. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of her writing has been very influential for me and I would really recommend her newsletter. And I will also pop this in the chat as well. Ooh. Uh, 
All right, next up. Uh, we've got two jobs. So one is uh, at Radbound University. Radbound? You, there's no N in that. I've been reading that with an N <laughs> uh, for several years now. No one's ever corrected me. Noted. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's in Europe. Uh, and they are looking for a postdoc, um, specifically um, in human AI, including digital humanities, uh, cultural heritage or societal change, or language and culture, including linguistics. So I think the this first one is probably most relevant for, for y'all. Um, so if you're looking for a postdoc in Europe, maybe give it a shot. Uh, and the other one is also in Europe, uh, just very Europe heavy this time. And this is for a paid internship. Uh, do, do, do. Da, da, da. This is sort of like the thing you'd be doing. The opportunity will allow you to engage with activities and projects, enabling critical thinking and digital literacy, literacy and aiming at building the capacity of civil society actors on the evolving topics of influence and opinion making in the digital age. So basically, you'd be like a technologist advisor to nonprofits is how I'm reading this. Um, so if you are interested in uh, that, give that a, a shot, maybe. Uh, and this is for Tactical Tech, and that's tacticaltech.org. So, yes. Politics. <laughs> Only a couple this week. Um, so the first is, um, I will say I am not a lawyer, but I believe that uh, Michael here is certainly informed about laws. <laughs> Whether or not he is a lawyer, uh, I do not know. Um, and this is his, you know, opinion as an individual. Um, yeah, you're very welcome, MB. I hope, I hope that helps. Uh, and you have a really successful, uh, enjoyable project. So we talked last week about how the Digital Services Act and Digital Marketing Act have now passed. So those are law in the EU is my understanding. Again, I've mentioned before, I'm not super familiar with the EU legislative process. Um, in, if you're not familiar, there's something in the US called Schoolhouse Rock, which is, I think it's from the 70s, a bunch of like animated little cartoons about various topics. And one of them is about how a bill passes Congress. Um, that's called, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. Those of you who went to school in America will probably be familiar with it. Uh, America, I should say in the United States, will probably be familiar with it. Um, I'm unfamiliar of an e with an EU version of it. So I don't have that same level of, of understanding. Um, anyway, so after that passed, um, Yan LeCun, who's at you know, Facebook, uh, and is a person that I don't agree with on most things based on what he says, um, tweeted that uh, sort of uh, parroting the EU's position uh, that, oh, driving systems are now mandatory, uh, all based on deep learning, which I don't know that that's true. Um, so these are things like automatic braking system and um, similar safety features that have been, you know, widely tested and used. Um, uh, also, the EU, all safety critical AI systems must be explainable. Deep learning must be banned. Um, so I think that that is not what the law says. <laughs> uh, we talked about it a little bit um, last week, and uh, Michael Veal uh, also says that, um, suggesting that uh, he is perhaps willfully mis misrepresenting the law. I can't speak to, you know, um, Jan Lecun's internal state. Um, but yes, I think it is, uh, this is a great point, particularly when legislation comes up, that before we you know, react to it or talk about it, it's really important to know what it actually says. Um, so there was a, a big discussion a while back on Twitter where there was a new bill proposed and a bunch of people in, in AI were like really up in arms and talking about it. And I, um, even though the language of the bill did seem uh, not great to me, I kept being like, hey, we should talk to lawyers, <laughs> right? We shouldn't just like, um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so the tactical tech link I will share. Absolutely. Do, do, do. There you go. Um, boo, boo, boo. Uh, right, because a lot of things that, right, legal language is a particular domain and words mean very exact things um, that as, you know, 
an NLP researcher, I may or may not have experience with, right? Um, and even if a law just like straight up says something and that's how we interpret it as lay people, that does not necessarily mean that that's actually what the law says, right? Um, so I think it's very important, um, particularly if you're in a position of authority or you have an audience that you are aware of what's going on with the laws and have, you know, an understanding that's informed by, by subject matter experts, which is why when I talk about digital legislation, I try to include, you know, the point of view of people who work in that field and study, you know, digital rights and digital, you know, law, etc. So anyway, politics. All right. Uh, next up is, I think, something that's super relevant to us as practitioners. So speaking of politics and like the, uh, you know, importance of being, um, anti-hype, <laughs> right? Which I would say is one of, you know, one of my core values is that we shouldn't lie to people about the systems that we build. And even if it's unintentional, right? We should understand the limitations of the technologies that we use and we should clearly communicate that. And that is part of our professional responsibility as technologists and engineers. Um, strongly held personal belief. <laughs> Uh, and this uh, thread is really talking about the risks of not doing that from a policy perspective. Uh, so Alex Engler here is uh, studies algorithms and policy at Brookings Government and McCourt School. Um, so. Uh, a subject matter expert, I would say, uh, and I'm just going to read this and we can talk about it. The systematic risk of systemic, sorry, that doesn't say systematic, the systemic risk of AI that no one in policy talks about is that we may be overestimating its capacity and promise, thereby misdirecting an enormous sum of money to the great detriment of other research. But I think it's absolutely the case. Um, a great example of this would be um, AI studies to detect COVID in lung scans, right? Pictures of lung scans. Um, and to my knowledge, no system that was built during that research push has actually been performant and robust enough to actually be used. And we funded that and spent compute on that instead of other things, right? Like even just uh, frankly, straight up paying people to be able to stay home and to meet their basic needs. So. Right when we when we do something, we are choosing not to do everything else, and particularly in the area of you know AI and NLP. If you're spending your time on something, you are choosing not to do everything else. Every choice has its you know shadow choice, um, and it's important that we consider what those things are and are very honest and knowledgeable about the um, likelihood of success, right, of the specific thing that we're working on. Um, so just to continue, uh, for example, the NSF budget for AI was more than 800 million last year, up from 120 million a few years earlier. Most of this was recategorization of what counts as AI research. Before research on AI, now anything with AI. So previously it was like fundamental machine learning research. Now it's machine learning methods applied to literally anything. And you are, as a researcher, incentivized to do that because the grant funding is bigger. And if you're not familiar with um, how grant funding works and research funding works, so in the United States, um, professors at universities, most of them, this doesn't apply to all universities, but it does apply to most professors <laughs> because of the way that scale works. Um, their primary job is not to teach. Their primary job is to do research and do research that is compelling enough that the federal and state governments give that researcher money, which then goes to the college or organization that they're working at, right? So um, all research at public universities, almost all research is publicly funded through grants, through taxpayer money. Um, research that is done at commercial labs, so like Google or Facebook, um, you know, DeepMind, OpenAI is all funded by private money with the presumably eventual assumption that, hey, we're gonna get this money back because we're gonna find some sort of commercial application for whatever it is that we're working on. So like BERT was included in Google search. Um, so what that means is if you are a researcher at a university, getting grant funding is one of the most impactful things you can do to, you know, help out your own work, be allowed to do more, right? Grant funding is what helps pay for postdocs, for research assistants, for people to help you out with your work, for students. Um, and as a result, 
what the U.S. government chooses to fund in terms of grants is very impactful in what research gets done. Um, and the point here is that, like, hey, if we're giving money to this specific narrow way of doing things and way of looking at things, we are, we are pressuring people, right? We are pushing people to do that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, the NSF did it since they knew Congress would fund every penny. They did. So NSF funding has to go through Congress, um, and it has been, <sighs> this is a whole big thing, but basically there's been, you know, eh, I mean, it's pretty much for, <laughs> as long as the U.S. has been around, there's been a strong sort of anti-intellectual, um, anti-research bent in, you know, just sort of our, our national ethos, I would say, um, where... It is not necessarily true at a national level, at a governmental level, that doing fundamental research is considered good. Um, it is considered good if it then leads to something that's like valuable, but most research won't because that's just how research works, right? We don't, if I could tell you right now what the breakthrough is that's gonna happen in the next year that's gonna change all our lives would be, I would already be making it, right? Like there's just a lot of unknowns, that's why it's research. Uh, which means that getting research funding through Congress, which, you know, again, there's a lot of very anti-intellectual sentiment in, um, it can be very difficult to get research funding for things like linguistics, for example. So um, when I was, you know, a linguistic doctorate student and with the LSA, Linguistic Society of America, one of the things we did every year was we went to uh, Congress and like basically begged them for money uh, and be like, hey, it's actually really good and useful that we know how language works and it's important and, you know, we deserve, you know, <laughs> the tiniest minuscule uh, amount comparatively of, of government funding. Like if we could have just like the cost of like one bomb and instead focus that on language research that would be great that would really help us out so um yeah it's a it's a struggle anyway uh is it good that the nsf reframed 10 percent of its research budget as ai because of the congressional Re white house interest in ai a good guess is no i would agree almost certainly it has some ramifications in the direction of science research it absolutely does so you know, as people working in AI, if we misrepresent how good what we do is and we oversell how applicable our technologies are, um, there are real ramifications to society at large. Anyway, that was a big long rant. Cough drop. Okay, so I'm really trying not to make <laughs> mouth sounds on mic. Um, it's a uh, whorehound flavor, which is one of my favorite flavors, and you really only find it in cough drops, at least in the U.S., which is just really interesting. All right, uh, and this one comes from London. And um, it's... So the UK government has kind of embraced surveillance for a while. So they have, you know, very widespread video surveillance that's run by the police in England. If you're not familiar with it, it has a name. I don't know the name on top of my head. I just know that it exists. And they've also started to use a lot more facial recognition. So uh, this is an example of the system and how wildly inefficient it is uh, and also how... Um, common false positives are, right? So um, this is, it's an independent article. Um, I guess I can link it if you want. Uh, but basically thousands and thousands of people were scanned by facial recognition um, and it resulted in just one arrest, which I mean, setting aside, you know, uh, opinions about arrests and the judicial and legal and carceral systems in the UK, um, that is a not a super good uh, trade-off, <laughs> to my mind. Um, but it also resist, resulted in seven false arrests. So those are seven different people who were, you know, incorrectly identified as arrestable and were arrested, uh, and also five other people who were questioned by officers. So 13,000 people scanned, uh, 12 people, um, you know, harassed, basically. <laughs> uh, seven of them arrested. Sorry, just, oh, sorry, that did not say false arrests. That's my apologies. False alerts, uh, you know. So maybe, actually, this might be a subset of that. But still, five people, you know, had their days ruined, basically. Uh, and it resulted in one correct match. 
So I, I've come out pretty vocally against facial recognition. I think this is a great example of why it doesn't work. Um, and the, um, you know, the privacy implications are pretty stunning. So this one, oh, this is interesting. So this is all about like, um, you know, the movies, etc. But what came out of this that I was particularly interested in was uh, this example of English uh, linguistic imperialism. So basically the idea of linguistic imperialism is you replace or attempt to replace an existing language with another language um, where the other language is being used as a tool of, you know, imperial power. Um, English does this a lot, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of a problem. Uh, and in this case, it's a private corporation doing it. So Disney has opened up schools for children um, in China, and in order, the reason that they've done this is so they say that they're teaching English, so that's the linguistic imperialism. But the reason that they opened up the schools was to create, you know, warm fuzzy feelings towards the characters that are used in these schools as educational tools um, in the children so that they will go buy Disney stuff and give Disney their money, which is, this is, I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with Shadowrun. It's a tabletop uh, role-playing game. Yeah, you may have gotten the impression that I like tabletop role-playing games. You'd be right. Based in um, sort of a cyberpunk fantasy future uh, where most of the power in the world is uh, centralized in corporations. And this is some uh, Shadowrun cyberpunk shit. <laughs> uh, yep. Anyway, so I just thought that was interesting. Hmm. So we uh, talked about recently some of the new privacy legislation that's been passed in Europe. Uh, and then of course there's also existing privacy registration. So uh, particularly GDPR. Um, in general, I would say Europe tends to be much more privacy conscious than the US. Um, and TikTok <laughs> uh, is getting in trouble uh, specifically with the, uh, uh, the Italian government. Um, so uh, the interesting thing that they did is that the Italian government uh, disagreed with uh, is they um, no longer ask for consent to process user data to serve personalized ads. Um, and instead they claim that they had a legitimate interest uh, and th that means that they can just track everybody for ad targeting without having to ask for permission, which um, the Italian government disagrees with. Um, yeah, also I would just say if you, if you are currently or consider have considered using TikTok, I would say that their data privacy is, based on my understanding currently, among the worst <laughs> of the major apps right now. And I would strongly recommend not using it if you have that choice. I know that not everyone does. All right. Um, and then this, I have very strong deja vu all of a sudden. I don't think we've talked about this previously, but maybe we have. When did this come out? July 11th, probably not, <laughs> of this year. Um, so this is just a really interesting um, sort of position piece, sort of digital humanities study. Um, and basically the, um, the way that they are talking about data and it moving is using sort of terms of fluid dynamics. Um, and there is sort of tension, and I'm sure some of y'all have run into this, a sort of tension between the ideas of like free movement of information and everybody should be able to get everything. And then also these, these ideas of like personal privacy and then also additional ideas of like authoritarian control, um, which are all, you know, butting up against each other. Uh, and this uh, article really talks about ways of thinking about that. Uh, and introduces the concept of data turbulence, right? So um, data friction was the, the older um, older term, uh, but they've sort of added onto it to create this new idea um, to you know create a larger framework to describe <laughs> the political forces shaping how data moves around. Um, <laughs> speaking of TikTok, <laughs> very political forces on how data moves around. Um, and uh, they then uh, apply it to a bunch of digital 
a uh, bunch of types of digital sovereignty in different geographies, which I think is just a really interesting way of thinking about data. I think it's a useful model. Um, yeah, and it's also uh, open source, which is great. Not open source, um, open access. So I'll pop this in the chat in case y'all want to take a look at that. Quick break for my voice. Hmm. All right, next up, ethics. Um, another little bit of a short one today. Uh, most of our work is gonna, most of our time is gonna be spent on, on research this week. So, first up, we have this excerpt from a book. Uh, the book is called There Are No Accidents. Uh, and if you've, um, if you've subscribed to the links, please, tier on my, on my coffee. Eh over there. Uh, I also sent you a link to, to buy the book if you're interested, um, which I guess I can also put in the stream. Why don't I just do that real quick? Da -da -da. Uh, but basically it's a, it's a book about uh, how decisions about design and, um, you know, what industries can and can't do affect users and people. So I'll just pop that link in there if you'd like to buy the book. Um, and basically it's, you know, focused around who makes money and who has, you know, their lives potentially and livelihood extracted from them. Uh, and this section is talking about the, the NHTSA, which we talked about. It's in the United States. It's a government organization. It's the National Highway and Transportation Safety Authority, I think. Um, and they are the ones who regulate things like... Before the recent Supreme Court decision that basically strips um, federal agencies of the ability to do their jobs, so I guess we'll see what this looks like in the future, um, they were the ones who regulate... Um... Yeah, they might be safe though, because this is like very directly interstate commerce. Anyway, uh, <laughs> talk to a lawyer, I don't know. Uh, that's what that point is. Um, is the role of the NHTSA in things like self-driving cars. Um, so this little section here says, uh, philosophically, they do not believe in regulation. It has nothing to do with public health and safety. It has nothing to do with whether people are going to die in these crashes. It has to do with the political philosoph philosophical perspective that they shouldn't regulate anything, and that is really criminal. Um, and I would say that this is something that's very much reflected in um, like the work of activist judges in the US right now. Uh, instead of regulation, NHTSA has issued what it calls voluntary guidance uh, for autonomous vehicles. Uh, it's the only federal regulatory agency that could restrict the ability of Uber or any other car company to let robots accidentally kill people. And I mean, Uber self-driving cars have killed people. Um, but the agency defines its role in the process differently, identifying and supporting the development of automation-related voluntary standards. And of course, voluntary standards hardly encourage accountability. The regulator has volunteered not to regulate. Um, so there's a lot of um, <laughs> American politics, basically. <laughs> Whether or not you believe there should be a, basically a federal government at all. Um, yep. Anyway, uh, so that's grim. Uh, and I would say that, you know, companies that are building self-driving cars have not done a great job doing voluntary, <laughs> voluntary harm mitigation. You know who I'm thinking about. Um, this is a really interesting think piece. Um, the headline says it all. Social media companies should be converted into nonprofits. So that's the argument. Um, and I'll post a link in case y'all want to read it. Um, I found it pretty interesting. Um, and I agree, <laughs> honestly. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot is that social media has become sort of our commons, right? Like the, you know, like the billboard where you'd place, post things in the middle of the town square, it's, it's online, right? It's a resource that would be very difficult for us to do without um, that is under private companies' control and... Um, yep, I think nonprofits is a great model. Um, and also I'd probably be willing to work at, let's say, Facebook um, 
is a, a nonprofit, right? And I think with the recent mm -hmm, <laughs> thing with Facebook, where someone said they were going to buy it uh, with perhaps no intention of ever doing that, who knows? I don't. Um, I think a nonprofit model makes a lot of sense for these sort of public good uh, companies. So a great example of a sort of a similar nonprofit ethos would be, you know, Mozilla. Um, and I, I've never used Netscape to my, to my knowledge, right? I think there was a time when the ethos of the internet and interacting with the web was very much like nonprofit, you know, scrappy individualist a little bit. Um, and now it's very much like corporate money machine, um, just like extracting wealth from people and funneling it into uh, the pockets of a smaller and smaller number of people. Uh, and I think that a nonprofit way of doing interneting could be really compelling and interesting and uh, beneficial to society, but we'll see. All right. And I promised we talked about this a little bit earlier. So this was the, um, we read this last week in Scientific America, where they asked GPT-3 to write a paper and then listed it as the first author, um, which I said at the time, and I stand boy, I think really borders on academic misconduct. Um, that would be like saying that, you know, um, autocomplete was your first author, right? There's no intention, there's no formulation, there's no critical thought um, ability within these systems. Um, and Anna Mills, I think, had some really good uh, points here. Um, and she's a community college writing teacher, art, author of How Arguments Work. So I think very much someone who knows a lot about writing. And I'll just read uh, uh, some of her, her points in here. Um, and I think that, you know, this is pretty much the, the core nugget, which is that even those who understand the nature of machine learning uh, may well not understand the nature, nature or origins of our psychological response to AI output, um, which I think is, you know, <laughs> we talked a couple of weeks ago about the, the Google engineer who, in his capacity as a priest, was like, this is like talking to a person. It must be a person. Um, and, you know, we're, we're humans, we like language, we like things that language, we want to believe that things are human-like, um, and yet, and yet. So, yeah, I think a, an interesting thread, uh, and this is by Anna Mills, which is at English OER on Twitter, if you want to check it out. Okay. So I'm trying really hard <laughs> not to make any slurping sounds into the mic. So um, that's how I'm doing it. Uh, so this is a NACL paper. So I mentioned it's an ongoing big publication venue. Um, and this is looking at whether or not we can measure whether large language models encode human stereotypes. So um, how do we know? So uh, this is a... Um, Twitter thread version of the paper. Um, and basically they use human judgments, right? And mm, human judgments of, oh, wow. <sighs> judgments of human stereotypes uh, along a lot of uh, dimensions, looking at the relationships between things and how strongly stereotyped equality is associated with a particular um, ability, not ability, the degree to which a quality is associated with a social group, basically. Um, so looking at uh, a lot of dimensions, uh, a lot of paired traits, um, and you know where people from different social groups are stereotyped to fall along these, right? So, uh, and then they uh, did some probing of the models, and then they did some scoring. Um, and basically the, the point is that like, this is a measure specifically for um, evaluating the, um, the degree of stereotypedness in a specific model. Um, and I will say that this is going to be potentially a useful approach, but very limited in scope, right? So uh, the, you know, a specific stereotype about what men are like is going to perhaps be relevant in a particular social situation, but not necessarily all of them, right? So um, 
it's not on here, but something like, you know, um, wears high heels, right, is stereotypically in the US right now, very associated with women, but in, let's say, you know, France 500 years ago, it would be much more associated with men and would not be associated with women. Um, and I realize that that's not one of the stereotypes that they're looking at, but these sort of like groups and how they are positioned in a societal context is going to vary depending on the society. So interesting approach if you're going to use it outside of, you know, <laughs> the US, I guess, um, or I'm not entirely sure what all of their, um, the paper link is here, I'm not entirely sure what all of their, their groups and stereotypes are, uh, but I think you'd probably find different relevant groups and also different relevant stereotypes in different social situations. Um, and also, this is just a, a thing. Apparently, uh, Deloitte, which is a um, consulting agency here in the US, uh, has trademarked trustworthy AI, um, bridging the ethic gap surrounding AI. As more companies adopt AI, leaders grapple with ethical decisions about its design and use. Global AI regulations will eventually address ethics concerns. <laughs> the law and ethics are um, at best correlated, uh, but until then, the Deloitte AI Institute is working to bridge the ethics gap. So that's something they'll promise to do. Uh, and uh, also on ethics, this is not super machine learning related, but I think a good example of where um, why it is important to think about biases in and differences between groups and outcomes. So this is specifically looking at pulse oximeters. Um, they're the, the things that like clip onto your finger and tell you how fast your heart is beating, basically. Um, not how fast your heart is beating, how much oxygen is in your blood. Those are different things. Um, and there are a lot of studies showing that they work better the lighter in color your skin is. So for someone like me, <laughs> who is extremely pale, they work pretty well. For someone who is very dark skin, they wouldn't work as well. Uh, Robbie says, these things I consider as applied AI. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Um, I don't entirely know how they work, but if there's any sort of machine learning component, then yes, I would, I would agree it is applied. Um, as a result, patients receive less supplemental oxygen, and it may explain higher rates of limb loss and death in Black and Hispanic ICU patients, right? So patients who have darker skin tones, this tool doesn't work as well for, which means they're not getting the care that they need to help um, save their lives, right? The, the outcome of the system not working very well, even in aggregate, you know, is potentially very, very bad. So if we think about, you know, um, self-driving cars, <laughs> if there is a, even a slight difference in how well these systems work for people based on how dark their skin is, if it works substantially worse for people who have darker skin, they are gonna have, you know, more deaths. Um, it, it, literally, it's life and death, right? Like, I, I don't know how much higher the ethical stakes could be. Um, and a great point from Dr. Crystal Grant here. Why do we permit a medical device system that embeds worse care for black patients? So in the AI, AI standpoint, why would we ever permit, um, you know, using a system like facial recognition uh, that we know is worse for people with darker skin? This disparity has been known about for decades, and it's potential effect of increasing morali nope, mortality for people of color too. Why did it take a study to prove the exact extent to which this is this mortality for people to care? And I think that's a really great point to consider as well, right? If somebody, right, even if you know an individual says, "Hey, the system isn't working for me. Hey, it isn't helping." Um, I think that there sometimes can, in computer and software engineering in particular, be a little bit of um, a little bit of callousness, right? So I'm thinking particularly, um, there was a set of, of news stories and instances a while ago where people bought baby cameras, so like a camera to watch a baby in their crib or a child to play, to like check up on them. So, you know, you're washing dishes in the kitchen and you can like check your, your monitor and be like, oh, okay, they're still asleep. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and there were a number of cases where these systems were hacked um, and, you know, strangers were just talking to children that weren't theirs um, in their homes in a situation where their parents thought were they were, you know, 
safe <laughs> and had no reason to believe that they'd be observed by strangers. Um, and there was a lot, I saw a lot of, you know, kind of dismissive reactions to this from people in technology being like, well, you know, they kept the default password, duh, you know, it's their fault this happened, they shouldn't have done that. Um, if a system harms somebody, particularly if I had no reasonable explanation, expectation as a consumer that a system could be harmful, right? Like if I buy a chef's knife and I cut myself with a chef's knife, knives are for cutting, it cut me, right? Like I think I knew the risk when I was you know, going into it, but if I buy a product that especially is like marketed as being something to help with safety, something to help, you know, make my life easier, and I have no reasonable expectation that it could be dangerous, if it ends up being dangerous, then, you know, that's on the people that made the system, right? Like, I know that consumer protections in the US are not as strong as they could be, but, you know, most of us grew up in the US, I should say, in a situation where we could more or less trust products to be bought, right? Like there is a certain degree of trust in people who make things and engineers built into society. And if we are not proactively working to maintain that trust and proactively working to make sure that we're not releasing systems that harm people, we don't deserve it. <laughs> uh, and we're gonna lose it real, real quick. So I don't talk about this a lot, but I, um, I lived in China when I was a child. Um, and I remember news stories about like people buying milk that wasn't milk, right? It was like water with flavoring and lead in it, or people buying eggs that weren't eggs. It was like a porcelain shell around like a fake egg looking thing and like getting really sick or, you know, people getting electrocuted at amusement parks or things like that. And it's, you know, having lived in a place where there really aren't consumer protections and people don't have that level of trust, rightfully so, in systems, it made me really value being able to have that level of trust and living in a society where people had it. Um, and we got to earn it, right? <laughs> we got to keep earning it every day. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's my rant. All right. Um, so this is something I talked about a couple weeks ago with the, the abortion bans about how much power we have as tech workers to affect change and protect our users, and I think this is a great example of it. So um, if you're not familiar, Alphabet Workers is the union uh, for people who work at Google um, and other Alphabet companies. And the union is working to uh, help ensure that Google I mean, they're working, right? Uh, doesn't cooperate with law enforcement on disclosing data related to abortion searches. Um, so there's a type of thing called a keyword warrant, um, which is basically where um, the police go to Google and are like, give me everybody the names and addresses, <laughs> IP addresses of everybody who searched the word abortion. Um, so things like that that are, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but that feels like overreach um, to me as a reasonable person, <laughs> um, right? So helping to protect uh, users who may be searching for information on medical care. Um, and I think this is a great example of where individuals and workers can have, you know, the ability to you know, shift the needle and help protect people. So anyway, and this is the last one. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you just get frustrated about stuff and, uh, uh, Abiba Berhain, you know her, you love her, we're a huge fan on the channel, I think she's a great scholar, a great thinker, highly recommend her work, um, <laughs> is reacting to this just like, nonsense, this is nothing, what happens if we put a sentient AI inside a lab-grown brain? That's nothing, <laughs> right? Um, anyway, uh, and, and she says, the amount of accounts that spew nonsense and contribute to AI mis un misinformation is astonishing. Yeah, and I think it has, you know, like we've talked about today. Hey, Chrono, hello, hello, welcome. Like we've talked about today, it has real negative implications, right? If this is sort of the milieu that you're working in and no one is, you know, being honest with you about system capabilities and it's just like hype, 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 misinformation, you know, misrepresentation of the systems and you're a legislator, then of course you're going to be like, well, God, we're solving the single most important problem in human history. Obviously, we should give money to this and not like cancer treatment research or, you know, um, 
agricultural research to <laughs> develop more drought and heat tolerant crops or things that are going to have, frankly, a much bigger impact on our ability to have long, healthy, happy lives. So, um, yeah, uh, Ophelia, a oh, doctor for Hain. She, uh, she finished her PhD recently. All right. Research. This is going to be, uh, not necessarily slow, but it's going to take a while. So more cough drop. I should get a little, I should make a little animation that's like, coffee break! Coffee break done! Just give me a second <laughs> to, uh, to work on that. All right. Uh, lots happened this week. First off, uh, this is uh, a pretty interesting paper. So this was from Knackle. I know it's a, uh, I guess you can't see actually, it's an archive link, but just like the this paper isn't in the proceedings yet, but it was published at NACL. Um, and it is uh, basically, um, any of you who have used, you know, GPT-3 or BERT or, you know, the T5 or any of those systems may be familiar with, you get very confident answers, right? So we talked about last week, we had that example of like, which is better for collaboration, an open plan, plan office on the ground or a small box in the middle of the ocean? Um, and the system's like, well, you gotta consider the pros and cons. They both are good for some things. Um, so you'll get very confident wrong answers. And uh, this paper is basically a um, suggestion and a method for adding um, head is what we'd call this in linguistic terms, right? So instead of saying Los Angeles uh, as the sort of like very confidently wrong answer, uh, instead saying something like, I'm not sure, but my guess is Los Angeles. Um, so it's not grounding, right? Uh, these aren't actually being fact checked. Uh, it is sort of based on the um, uh, confidence based on the model itself. Um, but I think that this is a good direction to go in, and I would recommend, you know, if you are choosing to build a system like this, which I wouldn't in the first place, but if you were, uh, I think hedging is a nice little extra layer of, um, of protection to do there. So cool paper, uh, and that is Reducing Conversational Agents Overconfidence Through Linguistic Calibration by Sabrina Milkey, uh, Arthur Slam. <laughs> Emily Dinan, Dinan, and Wylan Bureau. Uh, again, apologies for everybody whose name I said right, wrong. If I said your name right, you're welcome. It was, I wouldn't say a mistake, but. Uh, and then, so we sort of talked in the uh, politics section about how, you know, there's a TV show called Portlandia that ran a while ago, and they had a sketch in it uh, that was like, put a bird on it. Um, and I, where the, the joke is that you'd put a picture of a bird on everything. Um, and I feel like sometimes right now in AI, uh, it's like, put an AI on it. You put an AI in everything, and that's the, that's the thing that people are doing. Um, and this particular project, I think, is... Not really that, but it is definitely like a confluence of AI and a field that I haven't worked too much in and or read too much in, which is poetics, um, which is my understanding as someone who doesn't study poetics is that it's basically um, quantifying language, but more less it, from an interest in the linguistic structure and underlying, you know, truths about capital L language and more from um, an aesthetic and artistic standpoint um, and looking at taking that that approach to understanding and looking at language and then applying it to um, generated language. So if you're interested in poetics or poetry, I guess, <laughs> uh, might be a cool paper to look at. And this was from uh, NeurIPS 2021. So a little bit older, but um, I talked on my Twitter about um, language. <laughs> Docking says, put a BERT on it. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, so I talked a little bit on Twitter a while ago about how I've been really thinking how a lot of the, um, <laughs> uh, sorry, my, my dog's just being a little bit restless. Um, a lot of the work on language generation is sort of in the, you know, uh, tradition of things like exquisite corpse or found poetry um, or other ways of generating text collaboratively. Ah, thank you for the follow on coffee, Nalan. N A L A N, thank you. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in the subject, it might be a cool paper to read. 
All right, and this is Batya Friedman's, um, is a, I guess a Twitter report, <laughs> Twitter thread reporting. Uh, let me just get this out of the way, there we go. Uh, Batya Friedman's uh, talk at NACL 2022. Uh, Bacha is a professor, I think, at the University of Washington who works on valued sensitive design. Um, so she works in sort of design, UX, human computer interaction, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and the, uh, I'm just gonna go through and, and, you know, read bits of it. It's not super long, uh, but basically technology shapes interaction, which shapes human experience and vice versa. It can enable, hinder, and prevent, which, you know, particularly we're at the point now where enough AI systems are deployed that we're starting to get feedback loops in terms of behavior. Um, and that, you know, that behavior is then treated as data, which is used to train systems, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the moral and technical imagination, value sensitive design accounts for human values in a principled and structured manner throughout the design process, um, conceptual, technical, and imperial. Uh, on moral and technical imagination, <laughs> Bias refers to computer systems that systematically and unfairly discriminate against certain individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. There are three sources of bias, pre-existing bias, technical bias, and emergent bias. Um, and this is from a 1996 paper. So she's been in the field for a while. She's been thinking about these things. Um, so different ways of, of thinking about stuff, um, metrics, anyway. Uh, a lot of these are like very abbreviated um, bullet points from a much deeper talk. Um, and I think something that really struck out to me is this um, idea about a constructive way forward is responsibility to the public. We have a professional responsibility to communicate in an understandable manner about technology and its current and future material implications, right? So, um, you know, Google releases, releases BERT. What does that mean for you as a person who uses Google products? Um, you know, uh, facial recognition is being deployed in public. What does that mean for you as an individual? What are your options? What can you do, et cetera? So, uh, and then uh, again from Abeba Berhain. Uh, so this is a sort of discussion of um, a reaction to um, reviews that she got from paper reviewers. We talked about peer review a little bit last week. Um, so her and her co-authors, us, the drive for multimodal data sets, which are toxic, is the belief that such data sets are the path to AGI, right? So multimodal, um, usually language and video or language and photo. Reviewers, this is a speculative claim which can't be supported by evidence. Stay away from the concept of AGI, reject paper. Um, and then there was a nature paper last month towards artificial general intelligence via a multimodal foundation model, um, which... I think can be, um, I think this is a really good example of one of the ways in which sometimes peer reviewed research is necessarily going to lag, right? So she has a, a paper that takes a position that's based on, you know, discussions and the current state of the field, but no one has, you know, published yet saying this thing. Um, and instead of getting ahead of it and being like, hey, people are, yeah, hey, if you're thinking about doing this, please don't, waiting for the people to do things so then you can react to it. So you can have that dialogue instead of having um, a dialogue that's a little bit more like, I know you're thinking about it, please don't. Um, which yeah, is just, I think, one of the, the drawbacks of, of peer review, right? Um, it's hard to write the, the paper against puppy kicking before someone has written the, we should all kick puppies paper, right? Uh, puppy kicking here being a stand-in for something that most people would consider bad to do. Clang, 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 clang. All right. Next up, um, so I think somebody in chat here actually sent this to me. I don't remember who, um, I'd have to double check. Also, you can't zoom in. That's bad accessibility. Um, so there was a machine learning ST, I forget what the ST stands for, but it's a, basically a YouTube chat uh, of this um, technology YouTube with uh, Noam Chomsky. If you're not familiar with Noam Chomsky, he's um, uh, a pretty well-known academic. He worked in computer science in its early days. He worked in linguistics and it's, he worked in linguistics in like the 70s, 60s and 70s, I think. Um, 
and was really instrumental in sort of the structural generative grammar movement in, in linguistics. Um, he's pretty well known as an anarchist. Um, so a lot of, of uh, discussion. Hi, Ravi. Oh, was it you? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I don't think I actually need four of the same notifications coffee. <laughs> I appreciate you, but that's too many. Um, Mina, hi. Uh, welcome to the stream. We are in the research section now. Um, anyway, so uh, discussion uh, there of um, a lot of different things, and obviously someone who's worked as a linguist, someone who's worked in computer science, he's got a lot of thoughts. Um, I think he's like pretty, <laughs> pretty against uh, you know generative language models in uh, in general. So this is a part of the transcript. First, we should ask the question whether large language models have achieved anything, anything in this domain. No, they've achieved zero. So to talk about the failures, that's beside the point, um, right? So the the sort of. Uh, uh, stance there that he's saying is that, you know, language models, our language models are worthless. Uh, uh, Robbie says Linux Zoomer written, Linux Zoomer written in NIM. It's awesome software. I've, I've even seen the Zoomer app. Oh. Also, it occurs to me that, nope, that just moves it around. It is a set size. Whimsical.com, I'm afraid I don't think much of your user interface. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I think he's sort of underselling here. I do think, like we talked about the, you know, chatbots and large language modeling for na named entity recognition, I think it can be a useful part of a pipeline. I think it's just not a pipeline in and of itself, and that's where it falls short. But that's not fair, really, because that's not what they were designed to do, right? Um, it's a specialized tool that's part of something that people are trying to use on its own um, and, you know, kind of unsuccessfully, but it's, it's like me trying to sand something with a toothbrush, right? Like I could probably remove something if I scrubbed hard enough, but it's not the way you use a toothbrush, right? Like it's the, the wrong tool for the job, so. Oh, uh, Dr. Yai says the Machine Learning Street Talk podcast. Uh, yes, I think that that is what it is. Thank you, Docking. Uh, and maybe it was you who sent it to me. I don't remember. Somebody sent it to me. I also saw it on, on Twitter. Um, so whenever Chomsky says something, linguistics Twitter goes like, <laughs> uh, and then other people in linguistics Twitter are like, gosh, can we just stop talking about Chomsky all the time? Um, I, I would say he was never super influential in any of the linguistics subfields that I worked in. So yeah. Anyway, something to listen to if you like listening to Chomsky. Uh, and then this paper is also from Knackle, um, and I don't know, I, I read it and I think it's interesting, but I think it's one of those things that like, is not super practical, <laughs> right? So let's talk about it a little bit. Coffee. Um, so the paper is quantifying synthesis and fusion and their impact on machine translation. Um, so basically languages have different, is there like a fun figure in here I can look at while I'm talking? Uh, not really. Um, so basically the idea is that languages have different grammatical, you know, um, characteristics, right? We, we know this maybe. I, I think actually most of you are multilingual, so I'm sure that you know that. So things like, um, you know, some languages have a lot of morphemes that can be combined in a lot of different ways to create a lot of individual words. Some languages don't. So like English, um, not very morphologically rich. Um, German, pretty morphologically rich. Inuktitut, very morphologically rich, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, this paper is basically trying to um, create a measure that can be used to quantify on a sliding scale the degree to which languages have different um, uh, different qualities, specifically synthesis, so sticking together, and then fusion. Um, and I think it's interesting, right? I think it's sort of a cool way of thinking about things, but I think it's of limited utility sort of practically. So they are building um, a system to sort of automate this and find a measure and using that to specifically um, look at how important that is for machine translation. Um, but I think the thing that for me is like, well, this is kind of cool work. It's kind of interesting. I don't know how useful it is, is that um, 
grammatical information about languages is very look-upable, <laughs> right? Uh, linguists have done a lot of work doing linguistic analysis, um, and if this would be a way to handle like a new language without any of that linguistic analysis having been done, I think that might be helpful, but their approach requires a morphological analyzer to count the morphemes. So you would need a, you could only apply this on languages in which not only is the, the morphology well understood, these are both measures of morphology um, already, but also are well understood. That's a little bit unfair. I mean, every language speaker is going to understand the morphology of their language. Um, what I mean is well documented and well sort of like incorporated into the Western ways of knowing, which I realize are not the only ways of knowing, just to, to put it that way. Um, so things that are already well, you know, discussed in Western academic literature. I think that's a better way of saying it. Um, but also has the computational resources to do morphological analysis, right? So the language that they, they were looking at, I think were like English, German, and Turkish, uh, three very, like on a global scale, very researched languages. So I think it's an interesting measure. I think it's kind of cool to have like evidence that like, hey, you know, morphological complexity makes, has an effect on machine translation, which, you know, People, especially in NLP, like things to be quantified. Uh, but in terms of like a general approach, I don't know that this is an improvement over um, uh, let's see. I know that one of the uh, other uh, papers that they reference, was it the pain 2017? Let's see. Probably not, uh, but basically also all of this information about like the, the grammatical, uh, oh, it was this one, it was the Bierba 2021. Um, basically all of the information about the grammatical characteristics of languages is not only, uh, not only sort of like written down somewhere, but it's written down in a computer readable format uh, in centralized resources. So I would just recommend looking it up, um, but that's sort of like the thing that they are providing uh, a counterpoint to. And I think it could be interesting, but um, yeah. I don't know, it's one of those things where like, I think this is an interesting research project. I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> I just look up the information. Uh, uh, Robbie says the morpheme you're saying in the English language sense. Uh, so morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a language, right? Um, so for example, in accordingly, you could break that in down into accord and then ing and then li. Um, now I have to define a chord, but basically it's one word made up of multiple meaningful parts that you can combine together. Um, so ling English doesn't have a lot of capacity to do that, whereas many other languages do. English is, it's not a complete outlier, but it is on the lower end of the having, you know, morphological complexity scale, for sure. All right. Uh, and then this is interesting. So this is from Social Network Analysis and Mining, uh, Springer Journal, uh, and it is hope speech detection in YouTube comments, which I think is really interesting because I've never seen this task before. Um, but basically the idea is like, can you detect when people are being nice, right? What is the inverse of hate speech detection? Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just a cool task and I haven't seen anything like it before. Um, so uh, this is what their their sort of general sense general thing is. Uh, instead of us eliminating ostensibly unpleasant words, so like using a block list, which doesn't work really well, uh, we create a multilingual data set to recognize and encourage positivity in the comments, and we propose a novel custom deep network architecture which uses a concatenation of embedding from T5 sentences. Um, so yeah, just new task for me um, and interesting. Uh, Bjorn says, Dutch and German are like that. We can make words the lengths of small sentences. Great for Scrabble. Yes, exactly. Um, German and Dutch both very, very morphologically rich. Um, English was much more morphologically rich at one point in the past. We had also like a lot of cases, um, pretty much all the ones that existed in German. Um, we had grammatical gender. Um, but over time, we lost those features, possibly due to creolization with other languages, depending on whether or not you buy that hypothesis, um, which I tend to. Well, certainly through language contact, whether or not there was creolization, I think is a different question. 
Uh, but yeah, very good for Scrabble. All right. Uh, another paper. This one is from Interspeech, uh, and it's by the Alexa team, which, um, and this is on reducing geographic disparities and automatic speech recognition via elastic weight consolidation. So one of the things I studied in grad school was the fact that automatic speech recognition systems don't work equally well for everybody. Uh, and if you are from some places uh, and have language varieties associated with those places, like Southern American English, um, you may or may not be able to tell that that is my, my home dialect. Um, the systems just work less good for you, right? So sort of the canonical example is like Scottish English tends not to be handled very well by, by systems. Um, it's a, ooh, imperialism again, all over again. Uh, and this is uh, an approach to um, fixing this problem. So a lot of the sort of things that you can do do tend to sort of a common problem is that you reduce accuracy for one uh, group by and raise it for everybody else, right? Or if you reduce accuracy for some people and raise it for other people. For example, if you're adding more diverse data. Um, and my so my dissertation was really about. Um, different ways of doing that, <laughs> basically, uh, and incorporating non-linguistic features as part of your training, um, which is not what they're doing, but well, kind of it is a little bit. Uh, but basically what their approach is, uh, is that they're using these uh, elastic weight consolidation uh, regularization laws, um, and they um, are, you know, fussing with the space in a way that improves performance more for the people who, uh, for whom the system works less and reduces it less. Uh, um, and doesn't reduce performance for everybody else, right? So here um, they improved uh, word or rate by 3% relatively for the region with the highest word or rate. And then overall for everybody, they uh, reduced word or rate by 1.3%. Um, and that's good, word or rate should be down. Uh, so yeah, <sighs> word error rate. Uh, should be lower. So uh, yeah, I think an interesting uh, interesting approach seems to pro reduce um, errors most for uh, subgroups, which is great. Cool paper. All right, <laughs> speaking of things, let me get this out of the screen again. Um, this is by Talia Ringer, who is a professor at, where are you at? Illinois, uh, the University of Illinois. Um, and I think, relatively recently she had a promotion or something um but she works in machine learning i believe she works in proofs that's way too much information y'all don't care anyway uh i think the machine learning uh is one of the least healthy research communities i've ever seen in my life i had honestly i kind of agree it's not the best <laughs> for sure um I don't know what to do about it. It's just depressing. I hope it doesn't leak into the rest of CS. The work can be fun and useful, but the culture is full of serious red flags uh, and that cannot leak into the rest of CS or things will get really bad. Um, yeah, so just some examples, uh, an obsession with metrics, the cost of all else, uh, the lack of reasonable government and structures that help people escape unhealthy environments or safely report misconduct and have it taken care of, very big egos, lots of drama, hierarchy and fame. Um, and yeah, I would agree that these are all problems with machine learning and I would say that they are due to the fact that there is a lot of money going into the field very quickly um, and that tends to make people behave poorly. <laughs> I mean, just to be, you know, blunt. Um, yeah, and in terms of, you know, fields that I've been related to where there are like, to be frank, problems with sexual harassment, sure are. It's a it's an issue in machine learning. Um, not that it's not an issue in, in other fields, um, but yeah, definitely, definitely uh, a problem and one that I think will sort of resolve itself when, um, you know, the hype kind of catches up with us and people stop uh, investing so much in it and the money dries up. Uh, I think the community will probably get a little bit healthier. Um, that said, there are definitely some main figures in the community that are just stinkers, that are just not doing anybody any favors except maybe themselves. Anyway. Y'all probably know who, who I'm talking about. I've got some people in mind. <laughs> uh. Reading group. 
if any of y'all are interested. Uh, so uh, co-lead a critical AI studies reading group uh, for people inside and outside of the academy. So if you're interested, uh, check it out. And this is David the Wid on uh, on Twitter if you wanna wanna check it out. So, um, yep. Uh, also in the ASR realm. Um, I recently heard that the NVIDIA uh, NEMO conformer transducer model was doing really well on benchmarks, so I um, scuttled on over here to check, uh, and yeah, it sure is. That's a, that's a pretty low word error rate. Um, uh, let's just look at a couple error, let's just look at a couple languages and see how they're doing. They've probably got French, right? Yep, there it is. Wait, nope. It's thinking. Um, yeah, so it does look like the NVIDIA Nemo, mo Nemo model is currently holding state of the art on uh, on speech benchmark. So, <laughs> at least for English. All right, we're never gonna know about French, but <laughs> I guess click around yourself. Ah. Uh, also, I've got two calls for papers that should be next to each other, and they are, good. Uh, so the first is from the University of Michigan, and it's the Algorithmic Reparation Workshop. Um, so basically this workshop is a um, response to the work on uh, fairness models. Um, so the the point is that, um, hey, you can't just ignore, you know, demographic differences, um, right? You can't achieve unbiased outputs by ignoring everything about social, people's social identity. Um, you've got to consider the ways in which history, identity, and social systems intertwine. Um, in this way, fairness approximates colorblind racism and is gendered, heteronormative, and ableist cousins. Um, so yeah, I think this is a... I mean, something I've talked about a lot is um, that I don't think just increasing um, or decreasing the differences between different socially, you know, relevant groups and model performance is the most important thing. Um, I think it can definitely be important, right? We talked about the, the pulse oximeter things um, and the, the negative effects on people there. But it's also important to think about, you know, what are we building and why? Um, if we if we think about the Jesse Singer book, I, I mentioned, you know, who who profits and who pays the price, right? Um, I think this might be a, a really interesting conference. And if you have anything to say about it, uh, they've got a uh, call for papers. So um, check it out, and it is free. So I'll pop a link in too. The chat. Also, I have a sudden wondering about what the LSA in the uh, title is. Uh, ah, okay, so it's the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts um, in the in the link there. Um, also, I guess I should share that I've had an affiliation with the University of Michigan in the past. I've taught in their data science master's program. So, um, FYI. All right, and another uh, call for papers for a workshop that I, um, whenever it comes up, I guess this is the second time it's come up, last time it came up, I thought it was particularly interesting, uh, GEMS, so uh, the workshop on general evaluation and metrics, generation evaluation and metrics at EMNLP. Um, so basically this is, you know, you've generated some text, is it good? <laughs> right, which um, perhaps obviously, given the work recently on neural language generation and large language models is a, a poignant and timely question. So. If you've got any work on it, uh, send it on in. And if you don't have any work on it, keep an eye out for the uh, proceedings because there will be more work shared, uh, which I think should be pretty uh, useful and interesting. All right, this is a paper I teased a while ago when MT was asking about um, African languages. So this is by, um, you can see Mascani here, and then a bunch of different uh, affiliations. A few th thousand translations go a long way, leveraging pre-trained models for African news translation. So I think this is a, a really good project. I think you know the work out of Muscani tends to be really high quality. There's no exception. Um, 
and they are doing a uh, parallel corpus translation between uh, different news corpora, um, including eight languages which are not exist in part of any existing evaluation data set. Um, we demonstrate the most effective strategy for transferring both to additional languages and to additional domains is to fine tune large pre-trained models on small quantities of high quality language translation data. So like I mentioned, when we were talking about the um, uh, doing entity detection with uh, large language models, the benefit is just like with word embeddings, if you have really limited data, you can use the pre-trained model to sort of fill that gap. And this is an example of it doing that. Um, but of course it's, you know, it's part of the pipeline, right? It's part of a larger system that includes other things as well. So really interesting work, um, love to see it. I put the link in the chat if you wanna check it out. All right, and now we have a couple things that are just straight up marketing. <laughs> Um, so I've checked, and as far as I can tell, neither of these have been published. They're both from uh, Meta Facebook. Um, and the first is, um, Luke actually sent this to me, so thank you, Luke. Um, they have a system called, what's the system called? It starts with an S. Uh, it's in here somewhere, probably. Hmm. Meta AI. Sphere is what it's called. Um, so it's a system that basically checks whether a link is relevant or not. Um, and they've been training it on Wikipedia. And as far as I know, they have not actually been deploying it on Wikipedia to do automated edits. I don't think. Um, but yeah, so system that's out. Um, I would assume that they're going to start doing something similar with Facebook um, and sort of like fact checking stuff on Facebook, but I don't know that for a fact. So TBD. Uh, and the other thing is, again, as far as I can tell, this has not actually been published. This is just uh, marketing on Facebook's behalf. Um, they have a uh, project they called No Language Left Behind, Scaling Human-Centered Machine Translation. Also, I guarantee you they are not doing all human languages. So um, some languages left behind. Um, yeah, 200 languages. Um, that's what, less than a percent? That might be a little bit unfair. One sec, I gotta do math. Two percent, sorry. <laughs> it's just over 2% of the world's languages. So uh, like I said, some languages left behind. Um, yep, and then they've, they've open sourced it. Um, so you may be hearing about this. Uh, and then finally, uh, and I will post this in the chat as well, because I think it's a good resource and some of y'all might be interested. Um, there was a paper, a, this is a blog post that is a version of a paper uh, that I don't know if where it's been published, but regardless, I think the blog post is um, useful looking at uh, a comparison of the different uh, multilingual pre-trained models that are available right now. Um, so y'all might be familiar with Ember, MT5, um, XGLM, potentially, I don't know, those are the ones that I'm most familiar with, Indicbart, Afroberta, Indicbert, Mural. Um, so there's a bunch of different multilingual models here, multilingual language models here that are um, combined. So you've got the encoder-based ones, the decoder-based ones, the encoder and decoder-based ones, uh, and then just a bunch of links to all of them. So um, uh, this feels like, uh, uh, this, uh, this author is a PhD candidate, so this feels like part of a literature review, um, which is, really helpful, particularly if you're trying to compare systems yourself. If you can, so if you're trying to find out a, bun a bunch of systems um, or a bunch of approaches to something or sort of the current state of the art, uh, you wanna look for survey papers. So you can say that this says Amus survey paper. Um, so if it's got survey in the title, it means it's going to be a comparison of a bunch of different things at a specific point in time. Um, you will notice that BERT is not BERT, Bloom is not on here, and that's because this was published before Bloom came out. Um, I imagine Bloom will be added <laughs> to the dissertation. Be surprised if it wasn't. Um, yeah, so um, just a, a good reference. They got links to all the papers and models, uh, and also a count of the number of languages, which is quite nice. Um, and you can see they top out around 100. 
With that in mind, so that's sort of the survey, uh, let's get on to Bloom. So start off, what is Bloom? Uh, Bloom is uh, hugging faces, big science, um, what would I call this? Uh, working group, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what the specific initiative, big science initiatives, uh, multilingual language model is. So it's got, I think, 46 different languages, and we can see what they are here. Akan, Arabic, Assamese, Baramba, Baramba, Baramba. Sorry, if I say anybody's language wrong, um, know that it is due to my ignorance and that I am not, you know, making fun. Um, Bengali, Catalan, code. I'm assuming that just means computer language, English, Spanish, Basque, Fon, French, uh, Guajarti, I think, Hindi, Indonesian, Igbo, Kyukyu, again, apologies, Kannada, Ganda, Bengala, Malayam, Marathi, Nepali, Pedi, Pedi, uh, Chichewa, again, apologies if I say anybody's name, uh, language wrong, Oriya, Punjabi, Portuguese, Kurundi, uh, Kinyarwanda, Shona, Southern Sh Sotho, Southern Sotho, Swahili, Tamil, Telugu, Swana, Tsonga, Tumbu mm, Tubuka, Tui, Urdu, Vietnamese, Wolof, uh, Kosha. I know it's Kosha, I just feel really self conscious using clicks. Uh, Yoruba, Chinese, and Zulu. Um, so a lot of Indic languages, a lot of African languages, um, a lot of. Uh, not a whole lot of Native American languages, something that I'm noticing. Um, and of course, like lots of colonizer languages that are used uh, quite widely. So, uh, and then, you know, you've got the, the uh, some of the ones you would expect. So there is, you know, French, uh, no German, which is sort of interesting. Uh, and we've got like Vietnamese, but no Thai. I don't remember seeing it. Yeah. So uh, kind of an interesting selection of languages. Um, there are 46. Uh, it's an autoregressive large language model trained to continue text from a prompt on vast amounts of text data using industry scale computational resources. As such, it is able to output coherent text in 46 languages and 13 programming languages. Oh, so that's what the code is. Interesting. That is hardly distinguishable from text written by humans. Bloom can also be instructed to perform text tasks. It hasn't been explicitly trained for by casting them as text generation tasks. You can use it for prompt engineering. Um, yeah, so, uh, and then some evaluation results as well. Um, so it's been open sourced. It was done by the Open Science, sorry, Big Science Initiative. Um, and there's been a lot of sort of interest around it um, the last little bit, uh, and it is in PyTorch. Uh, and I picked out some of the discussions that I thought were particularly relevant or interesting. Uh, so one is, uh, this is from David McClear, uh, CTO of Open Syllabus. Uh, who has been playing around with the training data set behind uh, the Bloom model. Here's a sample of 10 million chunks from the English language corpus, about 1.25% of the total encoded with uh, all distill Roberta v1 and then you map to two dimensions. So this is sort of um, a rough approximation of the types of information that is in it, um, which I think is very interesting and useful and helpful if you're trying to decide when, where you wanna use this model, right? So here we have uh, Project Gutenberg here in Magenta. Uh, project Gutenberg is a project that collects and shares out of print, nope, out of copyright books, sorry. Um, so if anything's on Project Gutenberg is out of copyright, it's in the public domain. Open Subtitles, which is a big uh, database of subtitles from movies and TV shows, etc. cetera. Uh, the green throughout here is a uh, common crawl, um, which is a big scraping of um, text from the internet, broadly, broadly cast. Um, and here is the e UN corpus. So I think pretty much everything the UN produces is in the public domain, so you can take all of their text and use it. Double check that. Uh, and then we have US patent, patents, US patents here as sort of a gray cloud, uh, and then semantic scholar PDF. So patents are um, documents written to establish that a thing that you've invented is yours. <laughs> it is unique and you made it at a specific time and you have rights on the ability to reproduce it. Um, and semantic scholar is a, um, uh, scholarly database of journal articles, et cetera, and uh, metadata about them. 
So if you sort of like look through these, you can see that there is a lot of writing on sort of academic topics. So nutrition, diet, public health, opioids, oncology, cancer, genetics, biology, chemistry, physics, astronomy, math, CS, algorithms and ML, computer engineering, networking, hardware, ecology, earth sciences, uh, the sort of the green common call stuff include things like product reviews and descriptions, recipes, gambling, sports, travel, uh, blog comments, <laughs> you know, the best thing to train models on, um, business operations research, econ and finance. Uh, down here we've got non-English is this little blip here, this little blue blip, uh, and then code, PHP and JavaScript education research, recipes, I think I've read all of that. Uh, music is in there as well, and religion. Um, so some things to consider if you're gonna use this model um, is it's very primed, at least certainly in terms of um, um, if this is an accurate representation, uh, it's very primed towards academic English and academic writing. Um, I notice that news, for example, does not seem to be a huge section here, it does not seem to be a large uh, chunk of it. I notice that social media data doesn't seem to be a big chunk of it. Um, and I mentioned that the, you know, there was quite a bit of cleaning. Um, I notice that like, blog content may be folded into the rest of the common call stuff, but I see like blog comments is something. Um, I'm seeing that forum data doesn't seem to be pulled out. Um, so there's a lot of domains that might be missing, but if you are working specifically for something that makes sense, either as general text on the internet, um, <laughs> out of copyright literature, which is I think 22, it's 100 years in the US, so things that are 100 years old are now out of copyright, I believe. Uh, but it also has something to do with when the author dies. Uh, how long does copyright protection last? Uh, for work traded after January 1st, 1978, copyright protection lasts for the life of the author plus an additional 75 years. Uh, for anonymous work, pseudonymous work, or work made for hire, the copyright endures from 95 years after the first year of its publication term, uh, or 120 years from the year of its creation, whichever expires first. Um, and then for works uh, done before 1978, it's gonna vary. So they will be older, uh, whereas the common call text will mostly be, be newer uh, and more recently generated. So, uh, Always good to know what data is in a model. Uh, and it's, I would say that they've been much more forthcoming than other large language models <laughs> with what's being used. Uh, and uh, Stephen Mayhew, who uh, is at Duolingo, um, has sort of a, a section of like tests of him just playing around with it, which I thought was interesting. So we have, um, there is a little bit of a syntax error here, but we do have, looks like fairly successfully named entity recognition uh, from English to German. So the examples are provided in English and then the, uh, um, you know, output is in German, although it also, as you can see, continued uh, when you probably wouldn't want it to. Uh, grammatical error correction seems to work for simple examples in German. I also like the final example. example example, which I think is correctly grammatically incorrect. So um, the grammatical mistake here is uh, ich bin ein Frau, uh, which I think should be ich bin eine Frau, uh, and that that is a grammatical gender error. So I am one boy girl, <laughs> I guess, um, as opposed to I am the female, probably determinant article, um, girl. Uh, so this one is we're sind man and corrected it should be we're sind manner so i'm guessing that manner here is the pluralized form and this is probably we are men uh so we are man and corrected to we are men um i have no idea what this is <laughs> uh and then some code switching uh, between English and German. I have two uh, kinder and I play with Pupin as well as Otto's. Uh, next year I will get third kinder and I'm sure she will play with Pupin as, so example, uh, that's German words in sort of an English matrix um, and it looks like it sort of is working. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, just some interesting examples of usage. But as you can see, like this is not clean text that you could just use as is, but you could use it as part of a pipeline with additional tests and checking. Uh, Robbie says it needs heavy linguist knowledge to understand NLP. I mean, if you are working on language data, you should understand languages. Yes, I would agree. I mean, I have a, <laughs> I have many degrees in linguistics, more than I would recommend other people get. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I'm pretty, you know, I've bought into that. Um, I should also say I do not speak German. <laughs> I just speak a Germanic language and have read a lot of examples in linguistics papers. Um, yeah, right? Like, how do you evaluate when a system works well if you don't understand what working well or poorly looks like? Um, I don't think you need like a linguistics degree or anything, but you should be able to understand and evaluate language data. Uh, Bidirectional model. All right, uh, and another interesting thing about this model is that it was released under the Responsible AI license, um, which uh, is a new license. So the idea is that this license can help prevent, uh, uh, you know, malicious use of the technology, hopefully. Uh, I'm only interested in building NLP projects and software. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to get a linguistic story or anything, but, if you were, okay, so let's, let's put aside this license for a second. So um, I'm building um, NLP software, right? How do I know? And I would say this is one of the most important questions in you know the product design phase and you know designing your, your project. How do you know when it works? What does successful outcome look like, um, right? So you need that for you know writing your reward function on on one side, but also just determining um, sort of if you zoom out a little bit, are you fulfilling your business needs, right? Are you doing the thing that you need to do successfully or not? Um, and it is not trivial <laughs> to know that. And the more you know about language, the easier it is to. Um, basically figure out what success would look like and quantify it. Um, I think if you've never critically thought about language before, it would be very easy to design success criteria that will make it very difficult or impossible to build a successful system. So a key example of that is um, open domain chatbots, right? So a lot of people, um, I don't know what it is about this particular phrasing, but I've had many people ask me, particularly when I was working at Raza and doing a lot with chatbots, I want a chatbot that can answer any question, right? So that is a success criteria, right? Is is something that um, you could could build, um, but do you want something that can answer any question correctly? Because that's something different, right? Like just building something that will always give you output for input. Um, pretty straightforward at this point in time, but building something that will give you the correct output for the input, extremely difficult. Um, and if instead your your success criteria was something like, I want to build a you know chatbot that will let somebody check the current inventory in my warehouse using natural language input, um, over text, right? Like that's a very narrow success criteria, but that's something you could build a test for, right? Whereas, you know, having a good conversation, what does the test look like for that? If that makes sense. So yeah, just, I don't think you need to know about linguistics. I do think you need to be able to look at the language data and be like, yes, this is good. No, this isn't good, which means you probably shouldn't be doing a lot of work in languages you don't use. Um, and I think you do need to be able to critically think about language, language output, language input, and how you're going to measure it. And that's, I mean, that's, linguistics will help you with that, but you don't need linguistics necessarily to do that. Yeah, I know that was a little bit of a ramble, but it's something I think about a lot, uh, and I think is not necessarily obvious if you're coming from outside of the field. Licenses. I'm going to say right now, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> if you were thinking about using this license or using this model and have questions about the licenses, talk to a lawyer. I cannot give you legal opinions. Um, but uh, just some... Uh, it's interesting that they used a different license, um, and I'm just going to sort of... Uh, 
scroll down and like pop out things that I think are particularly interesting. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. So here, uh, inaccurate content. All user content as defined in here originates from users and as such is beyond the control of the company. The company neither initiates the posting of such user content nor monitors the specific content or accuracy of the user content being protested. So this is a little bit of uh, KYA, which I will allow you to figure out what that means. Um, without limiting or gener the generality or any other provision of the agreement, the company shall yeah, I hear you. No responsibility for reliability related to the accuracy, content, completeness, suitability, fitness for a particular purpose or delivery of the user content provided by any user, right? So basically if I make a, an image generator and you use it to generate, you know, a bunch of deep fake um, things that are harmful towards people, uh, not my issue. Um, but you have to agree not to use it for uh, stalking, harassing, threatening, or invading privacy, uh, impersonation, uh, forgery, uh, unlawfully transmitting things you can't transmit, including patents, trademarks, trade secrets, etc. cetera. Um, use it to create spam, uh, use it to create software biases and malicious code, uh, use it to create like robots or spiders, um, to spend a lot of, um, commands and like DDoS, um, uh, use it for malicious purposes such as mail bombing, uh, tra transmissions intended to rate the cost of another access to ex ex excessive traffic levels, uh, disrupt the normal flow of dialogue, cause the screen to scroll faster than other users of the product are able to type. Um, so that would basically be like spamming YouTube comments interfere with or disrupt servers or networks connected to the product, uh, break the law or collect store or store other personal data about the users. Uh, also, you can't use it to, uh, you know, detect or infer any legally protected class or aspect of any person as defined by US federal law, uh, detect or infer any feature or identity of any person, basically de-anonymizing them or other information. Um, Da, da, da. Uh, try to create deceptive um, media, um, try to use it in healthcare uh, situations like determining whether or not people are going to file an insurance claim, um, diagnose a medical condition, uh, detect criminality. We've talked about that before. It's just not possible, um, etc. So, uh, and then of course, like a big section on IP. But uh, I think these are sort of like the core uses that you're not allowed to use this um, this technology from, which I think is great. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, so there's this sort of um, discussion here. Uh, it's designed to act as a deterrent from using Bloom in high-risk sectors. The license is an experiment in self-regulating them before laws catch up. Um, ultimately, there's nothing to stop anybody from using Bloom. So I think it'll be helpful in um, preventing commercial uses, right? So like if you build your company around AI, um, you know, um, health detection stuff, and you are violating this license and doing that, you're opening yourself up to really big legal risk and probably people are gonna be less likely to do that if this license is adopted widely. Um, if you're just doing crimes, you're probably not gonna stop doing crimes because <laughs> it's even more illegal and you're violating the terms of a license. But I do think it has a potential for harm reduction. So I, yeah, I'm a big fan of it. Um, if I'm releasing train systems, uh, I would probably uh, include this this EULA, uh, EULA and user license agreement, EULA, EULA. Um, with it. So yeah, I think it's a great initiative. I'm going to post the link so you can read the whole thing if you like. Uh, talk to a lawyer if you have other questions. I'm not that. Um, yeah. And then finally, we've got a couple fun things to wrap up the two hours. Uh, every week, I swear, there's just more and more stuff I want to talk about. It's like things keep happening. All right. It's been deleted. Well, oh, okay, yeah, nope, sorry. So this is somebody that I followed uh, privately. Never mind. Um, I can tell you what the uh, the sort of um, general thing was. This is from, from Mark Hicks, who's a historian of technology. Um, and uh, it was a... Um, uh,
basically it was an example it was a visual pun <laughs> right of um two names uh, that were being treated as if there were morphological structure in front of them and then chopped apart and recombined where the um intended reading is that this word which is not deconstructible into the two morphemes that were inferred above um wow this is a really hard joke to explain one sec i'm gonna see if i can get just the image i think i probably can okay let's see if i can get just the image so i don't have to keep explaining this there we go wow <laughs> Uh, so it says uh, Mozart, this is Mozart the composer, Cinderella, this is the fairy tale character Cinderella, um, and then you can see it's half Mozart, half Cinderella, uh, and then this is a pile of shredded trees, which is mozzarella, and the joke is that it's the M-O-Z from Mozart and the Arella from Cinderella. Um, it's like the, the, these things are not breakable down in that way, and yet they have been, and that's why it's funny. And now that I've killed, I just wrung every tiny bit of humor out of that. Uh, someone toasted this, and I thought it was funny. Never underestimate the creativity of computational linguists trying to break tech pros and LP models. Uh, and it made me think of that. Um, I don't know if any of you all watch sort of short form videos, um, similar to TikToks, but there's this sort of trend where um, it'll be like the probability that, you know, your your dog is going to bite you is low, but never zero. And then it zooms in on the dog in the background being like, hmm, I'm going to get you. Um, and I feel like computational linguists are like that a little bit with language technology. Like I am guilty. Absolutely. I'm, I'm getting there and rummage around and see what I can do. All right. Uh, <laughs> And then there was this one, bless him. So this is somebody on Reddit. Um, I'm not super familiar with the machine learning uh, Reddit community because everything I've ever heard or seen has suggested to me that it is not good. <laughs> uh, but this is from Reddit. So it's someone who's trying to build a neural network model uh, to find the highest value um, in a in a list of numbers a vector right um and someone uh correctly says that you just get the the x at the highest value of y using you know built-ins um yeah so just why would you should not do this with neural networks right it's just going to be slow it's going to be error prone there is a rule to do it use the rule um so hopefully this person had a better day from then on out and figured out another way to do it uh, and then finally, uh, a little something to, to go uh, check out next if you're interested. So uh, Hillary Mason um, is the, I think she's the CEO slash founder, co-founder of Hidden Door Co, which uh, does um, basically role-playing uh, using narrative AI. So I've mentioned that I think that like games is a perfectly reasonable way to use um, you know, text completion and neural language models, and here you go. <laughs> Krona says, it would take so much longer to deploy a neural network to do that. Yeah, no, no reason to do that. Uh, and they had, uh, sorry, she had a, um, like a podcast episode, I guess, uh, with the Analytics Power Hour, uh, discussing just like a bunch of things. So I'll pop this in the chat if you want to go listen to this next. Uh, Hillary's great, fabulous data scientist, really like her work. Uh, I would also recommend following her on Twitter if you don't already. Um, and I've just like a fun thing to listen to next. So that's all I had today. <laughs> we did so much. Uh, so we talked about a bunch of practical stuff. Uh, we talked about, you know, politics, ethics, like always, try to cover those things, a lot of research, uh, some more discussion of Bloom, including the, the model, uh, the license that they have, uh, the responsible AI license, and then just some like fun to end with. So, uh, hopefully you had a great time. Uh, before we head out, I do want to quickly thank do, do, do. my wonderful coffee monthly supporters i know some of y'all are in the chat today thank you i appreciate you um it really helps me out this is uh i mean we'll see how long i can do it for but i'm trying to make this my full-time job so uh you're you're helping make that happen and i appreciate it 
So I will be back on Tuesday with a stream about something, and I don't want to make any promises because I might change my mind. I've been feeling kind of indecisive about Tuesday's stream topic this week. Um, it might be, I'm gonna say that and immediately do it. It might be on that thing I keep threatening to do, which is coming up with ideas for NLP projects and research. Um, yeah, so we'll do that on Tuesday, next Thursday, same thing, you know the drill. We'll be back with more coffee chat. I will have way more links. Um, if you are in the uh, links please tier on coffee, the links are already up. I didn't before the stream. Good job, Rachel. Uh, and if you're in the uh, Chit Chat Club tier, uh, Chit Chat Club this month will probably be on the fourth week of June, July, this month. Uh, so if you're interested in joining the Chit Chat, um, I do it before that week so we can figure out scheduling. Uh, and yeah, thanks so much for joining. I appreciate you. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.